What's up, everyone? I am back, you guys. It's been a long time since I've done uh, a live stream here, either on LinkedIn or on YouTube. Those are the, the two places that we're streaming right now because I'm using my awesome StreamYard. If you have just gotten access to LinkedIn Live or you're looking for options, I love StreamYard. The other one that's really popular is Restream.io, um, which I tried out. I I prefer StreamYard. It's just easier for me to figure out and and use, and I haven't had any issues with it. And we are here today with someone super special, super special to me, but also super sp special to the LinkedIn ecosystem and the greater world at large. We're here with Rachel Beck. How's it going? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I was excited to do this. And luckily, I've been fortunate enough because I just film you and you're coming to my show. So I'm like really excited we get to see each other twice this week. Yeah, I know. It's really cool. And you guys, there's a great suggestion. If you're ever going to do an interview with someone, do a podcast, see if you if you can do a swap. It works out super well. It's a great way to support each other and you get twice as much content. So why wouldn't you do it, right? Um, so for people who don't know who you are, which how do you guys not know? Come on now. Mm -hmm. Could you give just a little bit of intro to yourself? You know, what are you passionate about and, and who are you as a person? Um, I'm really, really passionate about... <laughs> so easy to leave a footprint of positivity versus negativity. And that really stems from that. I've had three moms in my life, right? So I've had the mom who died two days after giving birth. Then I have the um, woman who took care of me, my foster mom, when who took me into her home before I was adopted. So, and you know, my, then I have my biological father who I'm trying to find and my father who adopted me, who's my father. So I've had five, right? Five parents in my life. And I'm grateful for all of them. And I feel like they made a choice when it came to me. I mean, they really truly made a decision. So my legacy deeply matters to me. So I really, I walk in their, I'm walking in their footsteps. Um, Cause three, you know, that that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I'm trying to like give back to the people who took a chance on me in life by by paying it forward, not just giving it back. Like yes, backwards, but also really looking forward. And I love this footprint analogy, but paving the way with your literal footprints and your literal steps that you are taking. Um, it's kind of like you know if you were out in the snow, right? And you've got feet and feet of snow. I'm if if you've yeah. never been in snow, it it can be a. a difficult thing to tromp through if it's it's kind of high and if you've ever kind of been out walking around um you'll notice that it's way easier to step in someone else's footsteps and i think this is probably where the i don't i haven't looked into it it's probably where the analogy comes from is that when you're crossing rough terrain difficult to traverse areas literally stepping in someone else's footsteps makes it so much easier to make progress and go the direction that you're headed. So I'd love for you to share more about what, you know, outside of positivity, which is I think a really incredible thing, but also a really broad thing. What specifically are you doing to kind of like pave ways for, for others? Cause you do a lot of that. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to set an example that um, social media can be used for good that it doesn't need to be negative. I'm trying to say that you can use social media, you know, in a good way and that you, you can open doors for other, it does not need to be selfish. And that's my biggest problem. One of the many problems I have with social media is people tend to use it in a selfish behavior, right? And that's not the path, you know, we grew up with Sadaka, we grew up with meets vote. And so that's what we choose to, to use it for. We use it. We use it to say, "Hey, guess what? I'm going to open these doors for you. I'm going to let you walk through these doors. Here's an incredible opportunity for you, because that's what we're supposed to do, right?" Meets folk. Absolutely. And for people who don't know either yes. of those words, I'll, I'll ask you, what What is sedaka? Like, what is it literally? But also, what does it mean to you? Uh, Sadaka means in uh, Yiddish and Hebrew, it means um, charity to give back. And I've been learn. I learned about that probably. At my earliest memory is like two to three years old, probably three. And you'll know this, the can, we put money in from the uh, JM, JNF that would go to money for trees and sadaka. And also my parents are huge into sadaka. So I saw this my whole life. My grandparents, huge in sadaka. My aunt and uncle, all, all of them have changed the world. You know, they, uh, they changed. 
they absolutely have changed the world with their actions that they have they've done so i've seen this so they set this example for all of us and said okay so like we did this and now let me let me tell you how this works you go out there you become you become you know you're successful you do the work that needs to be done and then when that success comes to you you give it back you give it back through sadaka you do it through meets vote which you and i know meets vote are good deeds right we both went yeah. to jewish private school um so it's through meets vote and doing good deeds and you do it because it's a matter of just being a good human being <laughs> which you and i from being on social media we see the best of the behavior the world has to offer it and then we see the worst you know we see the good and we see the bad right yeah. so it's it's what you and i were taught yeah i, I want to ask you about that because i also um when i was growing up you know outside of the sadaka boxes that you would put yes. the, you know uh money into we also like my parents forced us to do good things even though like right as kids a lot of times you just want to play you just want to have some candy you're maybe not like naturally in your heart you want to be nice and good to others but sometimes you you don't want to do the things that your parents are saying look you got to do this because it's the right thing to do and so for me um we had uh i think it was like my great uncle ab um who was in a, a home and it, it was like a jewish you know um old old people home that's what we call it old person's home and after synagogue every week we would go walk like an extra one or two miles um to the the old person's home to visit my uncle ab and he um was not a hundred percent like coherent and lucid like he was very old um and also i remember like i never wanted to go one because i was already tired from walking all the way to synagogue which was another you know one or two miles being at synagogue, having to like pay attention. And now we had to go walk more into a place where I thought it was stinky. Like I, you know, so sometimes those homes can have kind of like a smell of medicine or like the food that they made wasn't that great. So the food was like a little bit stinky. Um, and I was like, I don't want to go to, and again, as a kid, I was like, I don't want to go to the smelly old person's home. Um, but my parents said, you have to do this. It's the right thing. This is family. And there's lots of other people there who love when you come, Mayan, you bring a lot of joy. You're going to do it and you're going to like it. <laughs> and so and like what I mean by you're going to like is you're going to put on a smile and a good attitude because you control your attitude. That's and right. To you, you're going anyways. So you can choose to be, you know, annoyed in this, but you're not going to do that. You're going to make the choice to, to be happy and to spread light and spread joy. And when I was a kid, it, you know, I didn't realize how it was going to affect me as an adult. And so I'm curious for you, two questions. One, did you have kind of a similar experience or did you from like even a young kid be like, Ooh, I'm excited about, you know, doing these really good things. And then two, how do how what's your perspective on like people who didn't grow up with that? Do you feel like a responsibility to, to help be an example for them? Like what just what's your thoughts on that dynamic around, right? Many people in the world grew up either without those good examples and people in their life, or even the opposite. They had people who were, you know, spreading and, and exemplifying negativity. Um, so I'm curious to hear. Okay, well, yeah. Actually, both. There's both. Okay. So because you and I saw the example, we said, okay, we're going to take this example and do this out into the world. And I, I, I don't talk about a lot of the stuff that I do. Um, I do a lot of stuff like behind the scenes that nobody knows about. But it's because of the example for my parents and for my aunt and uncle and for my Bubby and Zadie. Okay. So I remember things as like, um, like you're talking about, you know, giving out food downtown, you know, Philly doing you know, Thanksgiving, you know, yep. with my family, you know, from a charity to help them feed other people. Every lesson that they taught me stayed with me. And so when I'm out there and I'm doing it, it, it's because of that. It's because of their legacy. And I wrote, I wrote my parents a letter about that, you know, and they're, they're still alive and um, I'm very close to them, but I wrote them a letter now saying that, you know, everything you've taught me, even though I don't have children, I'm going to make sure, you know, that your legacy is going to live on. And they had, you know, I have other, there's other siblings and they have grandchildren. So it's important. What, what are you implanting in your children? We might not get the lesson till we're older. I'm not going to be happy unless I'm helping the world. 
right? And that's really what it comes down. And so I've always picked work that is doing that. You know, I did my photography business for 10 years, but through that, I was able to volunteer with a ton of charities that needed it, right? So, because they didn't have the money. Right, so, right. Right. They didn't have the money. And you provide so, an awesome service through photography that like really helps people in organizations. And they need it. So I worked with like a rabbi, you know, rabbis, pastors who needed help uh, sending a message out like, you know, Rachala, like we have a wonderful camp program. We want to show Shabbat. Can you come down? And I would do that or, you know, through the military, um, American Humane Society, D Diabetes Society, all these organizations that needed this, they need the work, right? But they can't afford it. Yeah. So would I have done that volunteer wise if I wasn't taught that? By my parents and by my grandparents, my aunt, uncle. I don't know. It was the lessons that they instilled in me. Now I've had many people tell me the same thing, like you, right? I rich. I didn't grow up with this. This was not instilled in my family, and um, they'll write me privately and say, "I was this. This is not the house I grew right. up in. It's not how I was taught." And I'll send them stuff and say, "You know, you can jump on here, learn about this organization, or check out this one." It's the same thing about etiquette. You and I were taught etiquette. I actually also, a lot of people don't know, I went to etiquette school upon, and, you know, school. So I've had people say, Rachel, I never learned etiquette, but I'm really, I really want to learn etiquette. And I'll send them links, you know, hey, check this out, get on, you know, get on this. You could study this. So it's taking that. And saying, we understand you didn't learn about it. We understand that you didn't have necessarily the opportunities that you and I were given. So I feel like it's even more of our responsibility to teach people. That's amazing. And I, you know, I, you know that I feel the same way and agree. And that's, you know, what I also try and do with like my social media platforms is not just show up and showcase, hey, here's what makes me happy. And it is supporting other people. It is really buying into the fact that people are good. And even people who make bad decisions or bad choices, they're good people. And we don't need to, to make them feel embarrassed or ashamed of things that they've done in the past, if they're willing and wanting to make progress now in the future, but then providing resources. I love that you're bringing that up. It's not just about showing up. It's about what do you do when you show up and you have the spotlight on you? Um, and I think it's amazing that you're not just showing up in front of so many people. I mean, hundreds of thousands, millions of people know who you are, watch your content. But when they reach out to you, you're not ignoring them. You're not no. saying I'm too good to, oh, to help I have, you. I have no love for people who do that. <laughs> you and I know each other. Well. No. I have like, no, even, you know, I've been out and about and, um, People have said, hey, you know, you're so-and-so. And they say, and you know, was, you know, say, hi, you know, so nice to meet you. And, I'll, you know, I'll talk to them. You and I have known each other for a long time, right? Pretty, pretty long yeah. time. And we're really excited because we're going to be together in person. Yes. So, the same person who you saw day one, follower one, is the same exact person I am today. And this is never, ever going to change. I have no love for people who have egos. I have no love for people who are selfish. It's... It, this is who you are. And remember, this is what people are missing. Yes. Remember who was there with, with you and believed in you in the beginning of the journey. Because those are the people who you knew that they were there to be with you to tell the story. You knew that they were there to, for not an opportunistic reason. Yeah. Right? They were there and like, okay, you have like 40, 50 followers. I'm going to jump on reach. Those people I'm still diehard loyal to. They know yes. who they are. Like I, you know, I still talk to them and like, Hey, how you doing? What's going on? And why? Because those are the people who gave me the courage. And those are the people who in yeah. the very beginning of my journey gave me the courage and said, Rach, I know that this is hard. They gave me the courage to do my first video. They gave me the courage. I mean, just everything and said, and said, you know, they said certain things that said, you know, step into it was like there was like three or four people that really changed my life on LinkedIn. They know who they are. And one of them stepped, said, you know, step into who you're going to become. You might not see it, but I see it five years down the line. Yeah. Or, you know, you're not you, you're going to a place where you might not be ready to. But this is this is what's coming. You know, yeah. so I was so moved by those four people 
you know, just so moved by the things that they said. And I'm trying to take that to my network and tell them every day, get up, get going. Like you can do this no matter how hard it is. Yeah. I love that. You're, I mean, you're bringing up the same concept, which is someone had an impact on you and now you want to pay it forward. And I've had that same experience. Like there's a handful of people that I connected with, you know, kind of first couple months I, I hopped on LinkedIn and they've profoundly changed my life. And even if I'm not currently, you know, frequently messaging, although most of them I, I am, cause I, I love to just hang around those types of people. Um, but there's a couple, right. That I don't talk to super regularly right now. It doesn't mean that I've forgotten what they did and right. what they did early on does not fade just because time has passed. It is still just as significant, no matter how much success I have moving forward, that moment will always be that moment that led me to this moment that led me to the next one. Um, so I'm, I'm really, oh, go ahead. It's loyalty, right? Right. Yes. You and I, but like, I will always be loyal to you. It's never going to, I remember when I first started writing on your post and I was like, Hey, my, like, Hey, and like, I just joined. I'm like, Hey, my, what we like, did every time? Cause you just like come over there, but you were doing this. And then we started talking yep. and, but that's how it is. So it, it's, it's the loyalty of friendship. You know, I'm not talking romantic. I'm talking about loyalty of friendship. You know, there's nothing like it. That's what it comes down to. Like you, we didn't get here on our own let's acknowledge that you know we have we have people who believed in us we've had people who believe in us from day one and that still believe in us and that's a loyalty of friendship i never ever say i did this on my own no i yeah. did this with a huge support system that is my network yeah and i think it's also it's loyalty but it's also integrity which is something that i think you have a massive amount on and just for everyone watching when i say integrity i mean to your own core values and beliefs. And that's why I think both of us honestly are, are successful on social media. And a, di a difference I see between like myself and, and when other people come to me for social media consulting. And I tell them, look, if you really want this to work for you, it is gonna take pretty hefty time investment. Like you have to talk with people. You can't just do a post and then like hope that that's gonna change your life. The people who leave their posts, yeah. like really like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, the <laughs> yeah. and, and I think it's that um, tied to, you know, that integrity to your own values that both of us have connected to paying it forward that makes us enjoy, not just willing to do the work, but enjoying doing the work. So like, I have a lot of people who they're like, look, I don't want to be on social media. I don't want to be on it for three, four hours a day. And to be honest, I feel the opposite, not because I like social media, but because I love people. And the people that I can help are on social media and I love helping them. So I, if, if you gave me a million bajillion dollars, uh, more than a million, right? Like you gave me billions of dollars, I would still spend hours every single day, maybe not every single day, but most of the days on social media because that's where I can help people the most and help people in a unique and a profound way. And I know that you get that too. Like you don't have to be, on social, neither of us have to be on social media as much as we are, but we feel a responsibility because of the integrity that we have to our own core values. Yeah, and I just said that in my post yesterday. Was, that's all I said. I was like in a quote. I was like, "Social media is a responsibility." Please understand that because some people are missing. That. You know, they post something. And I'm like, "Oh man, you just put that out into the world. This is just, it's a horrible thing to put out into this world right now." So yeah, I think we're con we were conscious of the words and listen, mine. I'm always honest with my network. Not perfect, make mistakes, and I'm not a freaking angel. That's just what it comes down. Like people are like, oh, I'm like, uh, no. I'm like, there's things I do. You know, none of us, none of us are angels, and there's there's yeah. that, that like misconception too that, you know, everything we do is no, 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 no. <laughs> like, so I try to share that. I try to share the human side. I try to share the mistake, I shared the tears when it's necessary. Um, you and I are also, I think, even more so responsible because as Jewish women, we take that responsibility very seriously. Yeah. Very seriously. I, I, so I've got a question based on something you said earlier, which is you said that you realized that the thing that really made you happy was, was helping others. Was there any particular moment or experience that helped you to realize that? Because I think it, 
you know, to you and me, it might be something that we're like, oh yeah, it was just natural. But like, if I really think hard, there were specific moments that helped me to realize that. So I'm wondering if that, you know, it has been your experience. I'll share with you, okay? Because this is a good teachable moment for people who don't pay attention to their post, okay? So I was scrolling through one night, like a Friday night or Saturday night, and I was going through my feed and um, twice, not in, you know, the same week, about a couple months apart, uh, someone had written, it's the last day of my life, right? And wow. so my heart stopped. Um, and I, this has happened three times to me. This, the last say, six months, right? And you know, I use my voice for mental health, like and pleading for people. And but the sad thing, mine, I'll be honest with you, is the person who wrote the post didn't even catch it. And I tell my network every time, look in the comment section. People are screaming out for help. So I stopped. I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on? Are you okay? Do I need to call 911? Do you like, what can I do for you right now? And I like waited. You know, and he, you know, he finally wrote me back and we talked and that happened twice. And then someone else had went, I don't want to live anymore. Somebody else's post who paid no attention to it, which I was, I was just, I was upset. I was like, dude, or just look at your post. I mean, it's, this, these people are crying out in pain. So I got a hold of him that night. Um, for both of them, I barely slept. I just, and they got, I said, listen, you're not alone. We're here. We are a community. We're family. If you need help, please tell me right now. And the person wrote back, Rach, I'm okay. And I said, are you sure? Because I knew him. And he said, yes. And he said, he said, I just need someone to see me. Yeah. Yeah, I and think you know. that's the kind of responsibility that people don't see. And if you have a post that someone's writing on that, you damn well need to look at the comment section. So I wrote back and talked to him, slept. The next day I woke up and he said, um, he wrote and said, Rach, I'm okay. But I barely slept that night. I was like, oh my God, you know, he's gonna make sure I call right. so, it, but it That's how I felt. And I had another situation where someone had written to me, um, you know, in DM privately. And, just, and I'm just, two of these were public. So I'm just sharing this without sharing right. his name, obviously. I had said, it's the last day of my life. And I said, what are you talking about? You know, and I pulled my car over, I was in the car talking to him for 45 minutes. I said, what's going on? The guy had lost his job, had was responsible for like a lot of children, right? And he didn't know how he was going to do it. I said, "Listen, yeah. what you, you can't do this like right now. Like, what do you need?" And he said, "I need someone to like look at my resume." I said, "Give me twenty four hours, please, please." So I took his resume, gave it to my friend who shows resume, but and then he wrote me the next day, "Hey, Rach, I'm here." Thank you. But th this is reality, mine. This is yeah. what's going on right now, and this is why when people are like, why are you so, why are you so, um, such an advocate for mental health? Why? Because people are on the verge right now, and yeah. so when I see people pushing somebody in a negative direction, it just infuriates me. Right? It just infuriates me. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious because I. I resonate with everything you're saying. Um, I feel deeply connected to those exact same issues in the exact same ways. And for me, part of where that not only responsibility, but just emotional, I cannot behave in a different manner comes from, there were times in my life where I was in a really dark place and I felt like I was on the edge. Um, and yet I completely, right, we're taught so well how to mask our emotions in society. No one on the outside knew there was a problem, but the problem was deep and it was painful. And it was like every moment you don't know what to do about it because it's so intense. It's so, so difficult to deal with. And you're too scared or too ashamed to tell anyone, especially because you're like, they all think that I'm fine. How am I supposed to show up and say I'm not fine, especially when I already feel like they're judging me or they have these different like they don't they already don't care about me when I'm OK. Right. I say I'm not OK and then they still don't care about me. That will crush everything that's left inside of me. And so like you, when I see an issue or when someone comes to me, it's like I will take whatever time is necessary to show you and really make you feel that someone cares. Because when you feel like not a single human being on the earth cares even enough to answer your message, cares even enough yes, to do this, it crushes any little bit of hope that is left inside of you. And sometimes you guys, hope is the only thing, even a little smidgen of hope is the only thing keeping people left alive. Especially this last year, let's be honest. Yeah. Since the 
pandemic, right? So you talk, the most desperate messages that I've ever seen have been since the pandemic, right? Or like people write me privately, to, you know, tell me what's going on. And I'm like, so it, it's almost, it's almost like our, it's part of our job to say, please take care of human beings right now. Like in, in the very, when it, when it all mat at the very, very end of your life, you can look back and go, did I do everything possible? I've, I've almost died three times. Maya. Okay. I've almost died three times. Wow. So I don't, I see things from a very different perspective when you have, uh, so we're near life near death death experience in NDE. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. You have a very different things that bother other people don't bother me as much. Um, I'm kind of like, okay, yeah, I'll get, I'll get through it. So I'm not going to waste it. I'm not going to waste my life. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. I was going to ask you like where that, that deep emotional tie came from, but I have to agree as someone who also has, I've, I've only had one uh, near death experience and it has forever and will forever impact the way that I think about everything. Because in, in those moments when that's happening, you, you ask yourself all these questions. You, the first question, at least for me, because again, a lot of times in a near death experience, you don't know which way it's going to go in the moment of it happening. You're asking, am I going to die? Is this it? Are these my last moments? And it it's almost not thoughts that you have that come from that. It's feelings that are beyond the words that we could put together. It's something deeper than words can express around how you think about your life in the context of the universe and just your existence and what that means to have had this opportunity to be alive on, on this planet. Um, so I'm, I'm curious from you, what has been the biggest takeaway from those like really intense, powerful moments um, that have really like changed how you operate and who you are and, and they're almost automatic now. They're not things you have to think about and remember, they're just a part of you from those experiences. Here's the three lessons, you ready? Because <laughs> all, all three of my near death experiences were very different. One was almost drowning. I had I'm a really strong swimmer. I actually swim. Um, I had fallen off a rock in the specific, and the current was really, really bad. And I got sucked down to the bottom of the ocean. And literally, my like my my cousin, my mother, watching this unfold. Right. Wow. And the water was so rough, and I was sucked down um, to a cave. And there was going up and down. And luckily, one of my aunt's friends had run. I was like, "Where's Rach? Where's the girl?" She's and they said, oh, they're down by the rocks. And he knew because he lives in the area. Um, I was in Mexico when this happened. He said, it's really rough today. And I had fallen. I really had fallen in. Yeah. I wasn't trying to go in because yeah. So when I was down there, um, I would go up, catch a breath, go down. Um, but it was like sitting there. It, I got this common piece. I was like, my favorite place in the world is the ocean. So it's like, if I'm going to die in the ocean, this is meant to be. Like, I, And I had... I was like, peace. I was like, this makes complete sense to me that I'm going to die in the ocean. This is my favorite place. But then something said kick one more time. And when I did, like, this my this guy was huge built. He had, like, pulled, ripped me up out of the water and saved my life. So that was the first lesson. It was common peace. The second time, I had fallen, slipped on snow and ice. I was, like, you know, clearing my car out. But the, there was, like, a little bit of a hill. I had fallen, um, broke my ankle, broke my leg, right? And my head fell behind the driver's tire in front of me. Oh, my goodness. So I was deathly, deathly afraid that the car was going to roll over me. Yeah. But I heard everything break. It was like February. No one was on that street. What saved my life was my cell phone, okay? I had put my purse in the car. The car's running. But for some reason, I had put my cell phone in my back pocket. And I called 911, family was there, the whole an emergency surgery that night. Yep. And the EMT said to me, this is what we tell people to do. We tell them, don't put them in their purses. Don't put them here. Don't stick it there. Because most accidents happen when you're by yourself. Yeah. And, and they told me, they were, I mean, they're, I mean, I, you can imagine the pain. You, you, your ankle broke, yes. your leg broke. Like, so that's the second, I got the lesson from that. Right. Like always. So I don't I do not hike or do anything without my phone and my I actually buy 
like hiking stuff that I could put my phone in my pocket. Yeah. That was a, and then the third lesson was to be a patient advocate. I had felt, um, I knew there was something wrong with me and I needed to use my voice as a patient advocate. So those are the three lessons. That's amazing. Um, and I think it's really powerful to share for people, right? Like hopefully most people never go through a near, a near death experience. Um, but being able to listen to the lessons that you've learned and how they've impacted you and making that connection between, you know, that feeling, that lesson and what your life looks like now, hopefully can convince some people, hey, I can adopt those lessons or I should adopt some type of lesson that maybe I would get if I was in a near death experience. And even just think about that. Sometimes you can you can learn those lessons through um, your imagination and thinking, man, like, let me really put myself in a scenario where I'm I'm about to die. What would I experience? What would I feel? What lesson would I take away from that and apply that into your life? And I, I've never talked to someone who's had, I've talked to a lot of people who've had near death experiences or if not in your death experience, a, a, you know, traumatic life event. And right. they all gained something incredibly valuable from that experience. And it's profoundly impacted their life to where now, you know, you, you'd be shocked to hear, oh, this person went to jail for 15 years or, oh, this person, you know, both their parents died in this horrible accident because look at how their life is now. It looks so incredible. And understanding that it's probably so incredible because of something that they learned or something they took with them from those experiences. Yeah, or something they survived, right? Yeah. It's, it's that was, you and I tend to be, <laughs> we know each other about, it. we come from a place of resilience. We come from a place of knowing that we need to move this world forward. You know, that, that that you can do that because whether we believe in, in everything we were taught or believe in karma, that if, if we push this world forward in a positive way and that it's that that energy is going to keep flowing through the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's a great kind of thing to, to wrap this up around and, and pose a question to you guys, which is what is the thing that is pushing you forward? Because if you haven't found that thing, is standing still is not is not what you're meant to do. It's not you weren't put on this earth to just stay in the place that you are right now. You're meant to push yourself forward, but you're also meant to push the world forward. And that push is probably going to come from behind you. Just like for you and me, that push came from our parents yeah. pushing us forward. But everyone has something that can push them forward so that they can push the world forward. And so I, you know, I'd encourage everyone watching, listening to this right now to ask yourself, if you don't have an immediate clear answer, what is pushing you forward to look, look back into your past, to look into your heart, look inside and think about what, what makes you feel that push? What makes you feel like you just got to go do something about it, whatever that it is, what is so compelling in your heart that you can't stand still? Because if you tap into that and you start focusing more of your energy on that, everything else falls into place. That is where you can make your greatest impact, not only outward, but inward as well. And I know that's you know why both of us are here talking about this, but also here you know, with smiles on our faces, here living, and again, not perfect. You guys, we're not perfect. We have bad days. We make yes. mistakes. Yes. But we we have a level of fulfillment and happiness that's beyond I feel happy today. It's a happiness of I'm alive and on this earth and I'm grateful and I'm happy for it because we have a push and and we are pushing and we're in motion and and it makes it not easier to deal with, but it makes it um more momentous to deal with things that come your way that are bad. Like you say, a lot of things don't bother you. It's it's because you're in motion. Yeah. Those things aren't sticking to you. Things stick to you and will weigh you down if you stand still. So if you can find that thing that, that puts you in motion, yeah. your world's going to change. Yeah. Can I tell a quick story? Yes, before please. You... Okay. please okay. Do. Right. Because I think you'll appreciate this. Okay. So I met the happiest person in the world. Okay. And what I met. Claim. 
Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Like, she changed my life forever. I met her in India. Um, I was visiting a leper colony. Okay, and I was there for a reason, which I'll tell you and I, we were not, you know, felt like. Yep. Um, so I was there and I was taking photographs and I met this woman. She was on the ground, right, in Indian style. Gorgeous. I'll text you a photo of her. Gorgeous, like orange story, sorry on. And I said, and her smile just like lit up the world. And I asked the director because she was translating. I said, I'm sorry, I have to ask you, how is she so happy, right? This woman had leprosy. She was deaf and she was blind. Think about that. Leprosy, being deaf and blind. And I said, how was she so happy? You said, Rachel, she was living on the streets and we took her, this, this is a leper colony, right? Everybody there has yeah. leprosy. And she said, Rachel, she was living on the streets. We found her and we took her in and she's grateful to have a home. And when I'm telling you this is the middle of nowhere, this is the middle of nowhere where I was at in India. Um, and I sat there and I had like tears, you know, behind the camera where I'm taking her photo. And I share this story when I give talks. And I looked at her, I was like, wow, if this woman can get up every day and smile with facing leprosy, you know, yeah. being deaf, being blind all at once, right? Not just like one thing that's like yeah. hard. All, I was like, I don't have, I don't have a reason to ever, ever feel on, un feel ungrateful or to not feel grateful at the same time. Yeah, I, I love that story, um, and I think again, that's something that we can all think about: is what thing can I be so grateful for that n nothing else really matters, nothing else can affect me, because all take everything else away, I still have this one thing. And if I can be grateful for that one thing, you, you can't feel grateful and miserable at the same time. That's kind of the power, one of the powers of gratitude is if you really feel grateful for something, you cannot feel bad about other things. Like our, our brains just can't process emotions that are contradictory like that in a single moment at the same time. So that's that's such a gem for everyone to you know take away from this at the end. I mean, tons of gems to take away. But if you're gonna take anything, to Dara Bah, to Dara Bah, Hebrew with you, yes, to Dara Bah, to Dara Bah. Well, thank you guys for listening. Go ahead and comment on here if this resonated with you. Share it to someone. Share it to your your network. Share it on your social media because if it changes and helps even one person you have made a profound impact and a difference. You guys, thanks so much and see you later.